as the struggle for Kerbin's destiny continues. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network must gather as much intelligence on the Communist as possible. They will need to make good use of assets based in orbit, and stay on the cutting edge of high-flying supersonic reconnaissance aircraft, and make sure that they never give up the good old-fashioned legwork by the intelligence personnel on the ground. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. Mr. White, the director of the National Security Intelligence Agency, wants to discuss providing flight assets for his agency's operations. In order to fulfill Mr. White's request, a new long-range transportation aircraft is needed. If the National Security Intelligence Service and the Space Center are able to work together well, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network should be able to get to the bottom of the communist mysteries near the North Pole. By combining the space-based assets, the reconnaissance aircraft, and their boots-on-the-ground operatives, the mystery may finally be unraveled. This first bit of cooperation involves the Space Center designing an aircraft capable of hauling four operatives halfway around the world to their secret Area 15 base. An aircraft like this should be ideally suited to meet the needs of the intelligence service. This aircraft is able to fly halfway around the globe, land on an improvised runway, and then fly all the way back again without the need of refueling. As the struggle with the communists grows, this interagency cooperation should be a bright spot for the Central Kerbin Alliance Network. Jebediah and Bill will crew the aircraft, while whatever the actual names of the operatives are, will sit in the back. Transflight, you are cleared for departure and immediate takeoff. Fly safe. Jebediah quickly accelerates the plane up to takeoff speed, after which he banks towards the south and engages the autopilot for the very long flight to the Area 15 base. For security reasons, most of the footage of the flight will need to be cut so as not to reveal the location of the secret base. This is just the first mission for the intelligence service, but if it goes well, there should be more missions in the future. I am very pleased you decided to accept my offer. We have you on approach, and you are cleared to land. It's amazing how well hidden this base is, tucked away in between these mountains. Although a reconnaissance satellite can probably read the top secret Area 15 written in very bold print on the runway. I thank you, and the nations thank you. Please, proceed to the runway for immediate takeoff. You are cleared for departure. It looks like the Space Center has made a good first impression on the intelligence service. A strong working relationship between the two will bring great benefit to the Central Kerbin Alliance Network. Yet again, for security reasons, most of the footage of the flight will be cut. As Jebediah and Bill approach the Space Center, a couple other airfields are visible. Transflight, we have you on approach. You are cleared for landing. Welcome back. Jebediah takes it in nice and smooth for a soft landing on the runway. All crew, passengers, and the aircraft are recovered safely. The space program will also help gather intelligence, this time by launching a new spy satellite. In order to keep its cover, though, it will be disguised as an orbital laboratory for scientific research. Although primarily a spy satellite, the contractor, Duna-1, asked that a cupola and mobile processing lab be incorporated with the design. The station includes its own engines and fuel so that it can adjust its own orbit. In the future, it may be advantageous to grow this station so four docking ports are added to it. The station will need lots of power, so lots of batteries and solar panels. Perhaps in the future, a dedicated power supply segment will be incorporated. This is to be a functioning research station, so different scientific experiments are also added. And lastly, for the station itself, it will be given some defensive weapons. The cannons won't be able to do too much, but they should keep the communists away. A few parts are rearranged slightly just to help adjust the center of mass of the station so that the center of mass will stay in line with the center of thrust. New crew members will be launched with the station. In the future, however, it is expected that crew members will rotate in and out of the station. The station is just a little over 19 tons, so it shouldn't take a very big rocket to get this thing into orbit. One Jumbo 64 fuel tank and a skipper engine is all that is needed for the core stage, 
Then a couple solid rocket boosters on the side will give the craft enough thrust to weight ratio to get off the pad. There are many delicate parts on the station, so the whole thing is encased in a fairing before launch. A few fins are added to the bottom of the rocket to help keep it stable, and the station is now ready for launch. And we have liftoff of Orbit Lab. The solid rocket boosters quickly burn through their fuel and then are decoupled. The skipper now has burned through enough fuel that it has a high enough thrust to weight ratio to push the craft up to an apoapsis near 150 kilometers. At 38 kilometers, the fairing is jettisoned. And right after the fairing is jettisoned, the main engine cuts off and is decoupled from the station. The poodle engine will do the rest of the work to get the craft into orbit. Near the cupola is a special camera that is able to mark targets on the surface of Kerbin. At the craft's apoapsis, around 148 kilometers, the poodle engines fire again, this time circularizing the orbit. Now that the craft has reached a stable orbit, engineers turn on its camera and begin running it through its tests. Everything appears to be running nominally. Wait, what's this? A message from the intelligence service. They have information about communist forces near the North Pole. The communists are having supply issues, and currently there is only one fighter defending the North Pole. A mission to send Didi Kerman to the North Pole is hastily put together. He is taking one of the production model K-101s equipped with a drop tank. If Didi is careful with his fuel usage, he should have several minutes over the target area and still be able to make it back to the space center. Hopefully, the intelligence service information is accurate. In the past, the communists had the area very well defended with multiple fighters and an air defense network, including ships. And the fighters defending the area are typically of their latest design, which, after having shot down a K-101 before, they've probably gained access to some of its technology, like its advanced radar. Although, it's unknown if they have come up with an effective counter against the radar-guided missiles. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network has been equipping its aircraft with chaff to help confuse enemy radar. At 17 minutes into the flight, the fuel tank is jettisoned. As Didi approaches the target area, there is indeed only one enemy fighter. Didi's fuel usage looks good, he still has a little more than half remaining. Didi now switches to his radar-guided missiles and attempts to lock on to the enemy aircraft. The enemy aircraft is heading generally north, now makes a shallow turn and begins heading towards Didi. As the distance closes, Didi gets a lock with his missile. The two aircraft are heading right for each other, Didi squares up and Fox one! The enemy sees the missile coming, dives and deploys chaff. The first missile missed. Didi does a hard 5G turn to reacquire the target. After turning right, Didi then rolls to his left and backs left. After a hard turn to his left, Didi is able to regain visual. The enemy is to his northwest. These hard turns are causing Didi to lose a lot of energy, but he is able to regain radar contact with the enemy. The enemy heads right at Didi. Neither aircraft is able to get a shot off. Didi makes another high G turn to his left in order to reacquire the target. The K-101 appears to be able to turn sharper than the enemy aircraft. Didi makes sure his missiles are armed and attempts to reacquire a lock on the enemy. Didi has a good angle, Fox 1. The enemy again sees the missile coming and deploys chaff and banks hard. But this time Didi is able to maintain radar lock and fires another missile. The enemy is unable to dodge the third missile and Didi scores a hit. A message comes in over the radio. Intelligence service reports that this is the enemy's new Yak-9 fighter. It is a supersonic interceptor. It is armed only with four radar-guided missiles. It seems that it is designed to take out high-speed Alliance bombers, but is less well-suited for dogfighting. Nonetheless, it is still one of their most technologically advanced fighter aircraft. There's still some type of enemy vehicle on the ground. He decides he must engage it first before he attempts to check out what the communists are guarding. Unlike the communist new Yak aircraft, Didi's fighter is equipped with a cannon. Didi banks around and will attempt to make a gun pass on the enemy vehicle. This will be tricky as the enemy vehicle is not stationary. Didi comes in low and attempts to line up his cannon and fires off a couple bursts at the enemy vehicle. It looks like Didi may have scored a hit, but the enemy vehicle is not disabled. Didi makes one more pass, this time the enemy vehicle is out of commission. And Didi brings his plane in for a landing next to this mysterious object. Didi's fuel gauges indicate that he still has just over half, so he still has plenty to make his way back home. After coming to a stop, Didi then backs his plane around and begins moving towards this mysterious object. 
Duty will attempt to park his aircraft right next to whatever this thing is. In this sunlight, it's hard to make out exactly what Dee Dee's seeing. Dee Dee carefully lets his plane roll down towards this object. Dee Dee, do you have any idea what this is? Do you have anything to report? Dee Dee replies that he is going to get out of his aircraft and try to examine the object from up close. The sun is very low in the polar sky, so it's difficult to make out exactly what things are with the weird effects with the shadows. Dee Dee informs the Space Center that he thinks it's some kind of flying saucer, but no idea who put it here. Is this some kind of crashed alien vessel, or is there something more sinister going on? I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me on this discussion about the Cold War. I will see you next time.